Well, let's begin with prayer. Again, from the Valley of Vision. All sufficient King, suffer me not to forget that I look for yet greater blessings, a hope beyond the grave, the earnest and foretastes of immortality, holiness, wisdom, strength, peace, joy, all these that thou hast provided for me in Christ. I grieve to think how insensible I have been of the claims of your authority and the endearments of your love, how little I have credited your truth, trusted your promises, feared thy threats, obeyed thy commands, improved my advantages, welcomed your warnings, responded to your grace, but notwithstanding my desert I yet live. May thy goodness always lead me to repentance, and thy long suffering prove my salvation. Amen. <clears throat> we come to the last episode. This is kind of like, you know, the whole Star Wars saga, you know. You, you feel like, you know, will this thing ever end? Well, yes, today we are finished. Episode 12, we are in this together. What's fascinating to me, I think, uh, about such things is how our culture has uh, influenced us. So you'll notice that uh, some of us still re revel in Frank Sinatra, and we, uh, you know, maybe hum along with, I'll do it my way. Or uh, maybe you're a Fleetwood Mac fan. I mean, this is a great tune. Go your own way, right? This is a great, great tune. Or uh, Metallica, you know, if your tastes bend toward the rock genre, nothing else matters. I mean, I can start humming these tunes in my mind as I begin to think about them. But all of those tunes, and so many more, I mean, we could go on and on and on and list the lyrics of so much other music. Uh, music generally has a tendency to focus our attention and it invades our thinking processes, as I do believe these have, uh, the American culture and quite frankly the American church to force us to consider that I am the most important thing, that the glories of all of life should rest on me. And so we are concerned, of course, as a church, that we not emulate the American culture, but that we set the standard for the culture, that we are not influenced by the culture, but we, the church, in fact, influence the culture. We are not interested in self-glorification, but of glorifying God. So going back to last week, as we focused on glory and throwing God's weight around, what is it that we are focused on? Last week, we emphasized this key phrase, we glory what we image, and those verses that I spent so much time hammering last week, Romans chapter 1, 21 to 23, that we really do focus our attention on that which we see as the image in front of us. Now, I have to say that as soon as I talk about these kinds of things and throwing God's weight around and not my own, one of the things that I struggle with, especially being on social media so much, is social media promotion. You realize, don't you, that in our culture that social media promotion is just kind of, yeah, you do that because you have to do that because that's a real struggle. And uh, quite frankly, I don't know that I ever have given myself an answer to the question of the kind of struggle that I deal with. But to promote yourself versus to promote that which you are giving in terms of content, I hope uh, is important and certainly comes across. But this is where we really are. The problem is we tend to focus on ourselves. Now this is not any great, I don't know, revelation. I can't imagine that it is. For any of us, because, you know, we're always looking in the mirror. Let me just pause for a moment here and uh, focus just on that phrase that I've been teaching against since the 1980s, which is love yourself. Uh, you know, the culture generally uh, tells us that we are supposed to do this, you know. The, the new phrase, of course, is self-care. Now, I'm not suggesting that you don't take care of yourself. What I am suggesting is that our focus on self really is an issue here. And let me just point us to one passage of Scripture on this, and it's not any place on your notes. It just kind of comes to me here, but it's Ephesians 5, 28 and 29, where Paul actually says, 
you already love yourselves. You take care of yourself. You take care of your physical needs. You eat, all of the rest. Uh, so don't talk about loving yourself because you already do that. You should at least, and in this context, it's about husbands and wives, you should at least do what you do for yourself for your spouse. So much more to say about that. Uh, not, well, I suppose I should also add this point, that in Mark chapter 12 and all of the other places where it says that we are to love others as we love ourselves, the focus is not on a third command. The focus is, as what Paul suggests, we already do that, so the focus isn't on self but on others. We are flipping the script, certainly in a culture that obsesses with the mirror. Now, I realize that of late uh, there are, have been some people around that have talked about uh, ease being the new drug of uh, American culture. I don't know where they've been, quite frankly, but we've been at ease for some time. Uh, Francis Schaeffer, whose visage you, you see here, one of the persons who probably most influenced my life uh, outside of the scriptures, uh, is the person who said uh, back in the 60s and 70s that Western culture is really susceptible to personal peace and affluence. We want to be comfortable. We want to be at ease. I remember reading this Washington Post article uh, couple months ago saying, well, this is the new drug. No, man, where have you been? This has been going on for a long time. So Schaefer's point is that we really just focus on ourselves, on our own needs, and certainly on our own monetary sufficiency, and certainly in the sense that we want to get ours, if we could put it that way. Schaefer said this, too. There's the quote right there on the screen. Leave me alone in the comfort of my surroundings. Don't ask too much of me. I have to spend time making sure of my own enjoyment. You know, I don't know if you all struggle with that, but I struggle with that all the time. Uh, my interest is in self, and that is uh, of necessity part of my, the problem of uh, the sin uh, principle that still resides within me. And so, as a church, we have to ask ourselves the question, how do we overcome that? How do we set ourselves against a cultural emphasis on Metallica and Fleetwood Mac and Frank Sinatra? Well, let's not forget the Constitution and the Declaration, shall we? Because I think, honestly, the Declaration sets us up for this as Americans. Uh, this phrase, the pursuit of happiness, is one of those phrases that people like to banty about, like this is the whole and total of American culture. This is what American culture is to be all about. Well, let me disabuse you of that idea, because the idea of Americanized Christianity is far from the idea of the pursuit of happiness. And just by the way, this is just an aside. Whenever you see a phrase that somebody suggests is an important idea, have to ask yourself the question, how did we get here? Why did somebody focus on this? So always be asking yourselves questions. You know, what, what was the point of this? Where, where did we come from? Where are we going with this? And how is it influencing me? So this, uh, this phrase, the pursuit of happiness in the Declaration, as you see here on the screen, 250 years ago, when the document was written, meant virtue. It was something that was a character-developed issue within the individual person. It had little to do with, <laughs> if I could also trash another famous phrase of our day, I just want you to be happy. How many times do you hear this in rom-coms or sitcoms or, you know, any kind of drama or, you know, the Hallmark movie syndicate, you know, all of that. I just want you to, what does that mean? And where does happiness come? What is the source of your happiness? What is the content? And what does that word mean? Nobody ever wants to talk about definitions. I'm always talking about definitions. You've got to talk about these things. They're kind of important because they actually tell us about how we ought to live. Now, I know that we're about to get in some deep weeds bit here, but he hear me out. I think this is important stuff. So there was some correspondence between the fourth president of the United States, his name is James Madison, and his friend James Monroe. These are a couple of guys that were considered to be founders of the United States, and this is what they said to each other 
uh, in this letter. Ultimate happiness, they're referring now to this pursuit of happiness clause in the Declaration, in which sense it is qualified with every necessary moral ingredient. The proposition is no doubt true, but taken in its popular sense as referring to the immediate addition of property and wealth. Nothing could be more false. So when these guys got together and said, let's draw up this Declaration of Independence, and what's our outcome? Our outcome is not... I hope you're happy. No, the outcome is I hope that we're building a virtuous populace, that the character of the American people is being developed from the inside out. So, next time you hear the phrase, I just want you to be happy, please throw something at the screen for me, would you? So, this pursuit of happiness means something like occupying one's life. I'm uh, actually quoting from Rogers, James Rogers here means something like occupying one's life with the activities that provide for overall well-being. This certainly includes a right to material things, but, here's the underlined section, it goes beyond that to include humanity's spiritual and moral condition. By the way, whenever I do these kinds of things, I put all this stuff in your handout, so you can even find the reference to this uh, guy's writings in First Things, if you're so inclined. Go check it out, look it up. And I, I would just like to highlight this idea again, that the history of words is paramount. How did we get the words that we have now? And what did they start off as? So just understand that words are malleable. They change constantly. And we think about words differently now than we did 250 years ago. Just keep that in mind as you're thinking about this, some of this. Now, I'm gonna, I'm, what I'm not saying about Americanized Christianity is that I'm not a patriot. I am thoroughgoing, flag-waving, lump in my throat when the national anthem is played. I do not kneel for that. This is the kind of person that I am. I'm an American patriot. I love this country. I think it's a great place to live. Uh, the founders had a great idea, and the idea continues to exist. However, the struggle I have, and I've actually included this in your notes as well, uh, back in 2019 I actually did a truth and two on this, uh, where I struggle with being an American Christian. Because in America our focus on individualism and hedonism, where pleasure is all that I'm interested in, cuts cross grain against Philippians 2.4, for instance, which says, look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. So our lives are supposed to be sacrificial lives to other people and not simply focus on self. So I am a believer in Jesus as Lord. I am a Christian. I am a Christ follower. However, I also live in the United States of America. And I am just as proud to live here as, what was it, the team that won just recently? Did the Moroccans win? Yeah, see, the Moroccans won in the World Cup. I bet Morocco is effulgent with glory today, and rightly so, just as much as I am when something good happens in the United States. So, understand the difference between Americanized Christianity and being an American Christian. All right. Now, we couldn't talk about this without Mark talking about movies. So I want to bring up this movie, one of the classics, probably in the top ten of everybody's list someplace. But I want to just mention this scene in the middle of the movie. Now, if you remember this, some of you who are older maybe have seen this uh, and you revel in it. There's this scene where in this neutral bar, uh, just ahead of America getting into World War II, the, Germans, uh, the German soldiers stand up and began to sing the German national anthem. The French, who are in the bar also, because it's a neutral bar, there's no fighting going on here, began to stand up and sing their national anthem. And it's like this great battle of voices. It's one of the great scenes in that movie. If you haven't seen it for a while, check it out. And the French are overcome with emotion because... The Germans are the one who, is in, who have invaded their homeland. So think about that in terms of how do we respond? How do we think differently about belonging to something? And how important that might be to us and to people. Add to this a story, of course, that everybody's going to be watching at some point. Maybe you already have. 
And this uh, Christmas story, uh, A Wonderful Life, has tremendous emphasis of community and belonging and caring for other people. This is a really great story. And just as a side note, I hope that sometime you watch the documentary series. It's a five-part series called Five Came Back. And the five came back refer to five filmmakers that were filmmakers before World War II started, and they went into World War II and documented what they saw with film and then came back and began to make movies again. And guess who one of them was? Frank Capra. He's the guy who did this movie. And oh, by the way, this is the first movie he made after coming back from seeing what he saw in World War II. If you see that documentary, you will begin to understand the background of why he did this movie the way he did. I'll just leave that there. Very important stuff, but again, the emphasis on community and why is a life worth living. And here is one I'm just going to mention because I think it's important because in, as, as days go on for the church in the United States of America, but certainly is already happening around the world, uh, the concern of persecution will continue to be an issue for us. And I think, and I'm going to be writing on this uh, in the coming days, about the church establishing or reestablishing itself as a minority status. I think we need to stop talking about the moral majority and begin to stop, start talking about the moral minority. I think we need to talk about the church in terms of us being in the minority in this culture, because we are. And I'm not talking about how many people go to church or how many people call themselves Christians. I'm talking about people who have committed themselves to the Lordship of Jesus and live the lives that we should live based on what Gospels uh, teaches us. Courage is going to be the watchword of our future. All right. So what does all of that have to do with we're in this together? We're talking about the church today. Well, let's give some admonition throughout the scriptures, shall we, about what this does mean. Now, God's people in the First Testament and God's people in the Second Testament, while different from each other, are the same. That is, they are God's people, chosen people. Deuteronomy chapter 7, one of my favorite covenantal statements about God choosing his people, and they were not better than anybody else, but he chose them. And, of course, the same would be true with the Christian in the Second Testament, that we have been chosen. This isn't something we did. It's something that he did for us. And so because of that, we have our allegiance to God, but also allegiance to each other, the church. And here's where I have to apologize because, you know, we only have a certain amount of time to do this on Sunday mornings. And what I would love to do is launch into a long explanation of the universal church and the local church and the importance of all of these entities within the church, but we don't have time for all of that. All I can suggest is that we're going to highlight some very important truths that will then, or could be then, magnified in our specific settings, uh, whether it be in our families, in our local church, or around the world. So let's begin with the most obvious one, shall we? Uh, I think this is just a tremendous statement uh, by Jesus in his high priestly prayer. And this is what he prayed. I do not ask for those only, but also for those who believe in me through their word. He's speaking first to the, about the disciples. That they may all be one. Let's count these now. That they may all be one, just as you, the Father, are in me and I in you. That they may also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Verse 22, the glory that you have given me. I have given to them that they may be one, second time, even as we are one, third time. I in them and you in me, and that they may be perfectly one, fourth time, so that the world may know that you sent me and love them even as you loved me. Four times in these verses, that they may be one. Do we get the point? <laughs> it doesn't matter, Galatians chapter 3. What does Galatians chapter 3 say? Very clearly. There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female. We are all one in Christ Jesus. It breaks down ethnic barriers. It breaks down class barriers, and it breaks down gender barriers. There should be no barriers. And according to Ephesians chapter 4, Jesus kind of eliminated the barriers. Uh, Ephesians chapter 2, and the emphasis there about 
being one is kind of crucial. So we view ourselves in mission with each other and with all other Christian churches as one. To that point, we then meet, need to establish the classic passage, which is Acts chapter 2. And when we come to Acts chapter 2, what is it that we are responsible for in the church? Here it is, verses 42 to 47. And they dev devoted themselves, they being all of these new believers, devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayers, and awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the needs to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received the food with gladness and generous hearts, praising God, having favor with all people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who are being saved. If you want a classic statement of what the church, capital T, capital C, should be, here it is, Acts 2. And you can add to that, by the way, the follow-up to that on the very next, well, almost the next chapter, which is this uh, classic passage in Acts chapter 4, verses 32 to 37, where people actually were giving away their stuff. And by the way, that's not Christian communism in this passage. It is people who held their personal private belongings sharing it with others who were in need. That just goes right along with 2, 42 to 47. All of these things are essential to help us to understand we are in this together. The church, not only in this body, but across the world and across Indianapolis for that matter. So this is uh, my friend H.B. Bell and I. Uh, he's my brother. He calls me his white twin. He calls me his white twin because we think a lot alike. And we care about people. And so if I were going to classify our concerns for each other, it would probably be in this passage in Romans chapter 12. By the way, if you want one passage that kind of emulates just kind of these general commands of what we ought to be doing for each other, I've listed some of them here for you. Uh, but Romans chapter 12, verses 3 through the end of the chapter is this amazing list of how we ought to be treating each other. And the key, of course, to this is loving one another with brotherly affection. So, you are my brothers and sisters, and I am your brother. And we are so because we are part of this family of God, God's people, because we are in this together. What is the point of Romans chapter 12? What is the point of the teaching of Jesus? What is the point of the teaching of Moses all the way through the prophets and through to John and Revelation? It is not self, it is others. Frank Sinatra was wrong. Now, here's a, this is a slide that didn't get put in. It's my fault. Because I woke up this morning at whatever time it was that I wake up, which is way always too early, and my first immediate thought was, how come you didn't put this slide in the slideshow? So, I'm about to talk about the witness of the church. But before I talk about the witness of the church, what I wish I would have done is put a slide in to just give you a snapshot of at least two different ideas that run through Scripture about our witness. If we are in this together, what are we in this to be? So in First Testament teaching, we're in this to be priests. So if you think about, if you want to write down some passages, if uh, Exodus 19, 5 and 6, says that the Israelites, the people of Israel, Exodus 19, were to be the priests, the go-betweens between Yahweh and all the other nations. That means that they were going to be giving information, giving the law, showing how to live in the world. And gee, does that sound vaguely familiar? I hope it does. In 1 Peter 2, 9, it says that we are a priesthood of believers, a kingdom of priests. So our responsibility as a witness is the go-between between the Lord and our world around us. We are priests. But there is also this other marvelous statement in both Testaments about light. And according to Isaiah 9, which, by the way, is kind of prominent these days around Christmas about uh, this famous line in, in 9.6, but I wanted to go back to 9.2, 
uh, where it says that people who have walked in darkness, who have, who have seen a great light, and of course, this is a progenitor, a, a forecasting of Jesus. Well, guess what? The light is coming also through the nation of Israel. In chapter 49, in verse 6, it says that I'm going to make you a light to the nations. Also in chapter 60 in Isaiah, that the nations will come to your light. Gee, do you, does this sound vaguely familiar like something Jesus said? You are to be the light of the world. He says this twice in Matthew chapter 5. And it's all based on the idea in John chapter 8 that he is the light of the world. But we are also the lights. Well, one of the passages I think that it's important to read at this point is Philippians chapter 2. This is phenomenal. And the idea of what we are responsible for, the church, to the world, hear these words. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now not only in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Boy, there's a whole series. Verse 13, for it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Do all things without grumbling or questioning that you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. That's to be our witness. We are priests and we are light. Okay, so there's the slide I should have put in. Let's get on with it, shall we? The emphasis of witness. How do we witness to the culture around us? One of the keys, or one of the key passages, I think, again, First Testament teaching, is Deuteronomy 15, 7 through 11, where he, Moses uses this great illustration. He says, I don't want you to be tight-fisted. I want you to be open-handed. Both those statements are made there. So if your brother's in need and you see a need, don't be tight-fisted and hold on to your money. Be open-handed and help your brother. Deuteronomy chapter 15. Acts chapter 4. Uh, well, I've mentioned two here, but I also wanted to emphasize four. We've already talked about those. Uh, this, 2 Corinthians 8, boy, talk about a backhanded slap in the face. I mean, basically, chapters 8 and 9 in 2 Corinthians is Paul taking the Corinthians by the collar and doing this. You know, wake up, would you? Because here are the poor people. He starts out with all the poor people in chapter 8, verses 1 to 5. And look how much they've given. And basically what he's saying to the Corinthians is, you all are rich over here, but you haven't given us much. So, you know, let's break out the wallet, shall we? All of that's Eccles' free translation, you understand. <laughs> First John chapter 3, if you see your brother in need, says the same thing, by the way, in James chapter 2. You don't just pray, well, you know, I hope. Pray to God for your finance. No. You give. First Timothy chapter 6, all of these four commands to people who have money. This is huge. Guess what? The world sees that generosity, and they look at it, and they go, how in the world can these people be loving each other so well? This is really impressive. And then we go to the one another's, which there are about 50, I think it, it's 56 times in Second Testament teaching that one another's are being used, but over and over and over again, we find that we are responsible to love one another, to encourage each other, to exhort one another, to instruct one another, not to judge one another, all of those kinds of things. And I've just given you a free few verses here from the book of Romans, but there's a whole bunch of stuff. So as an educator, as a teacher, what I'm basically saying to you is you all have homework now. Go check out the rest of the one another's. Write a paper. Turn it into me. No, I'm, I, got, I have way too many papers to grade. Forget that. Kindness and patience as witness. The famous love chapter, 1 Corinthians 13, quoted at everybody's wedding. What does it say that we're supposed to be between spouses? <laughs> Patient and kind. Check that out. By the way, your closest neighbor lives with you. Did you know that? You're supposed to love your neighbor. Well, you're, the closest one lives in your house. So that's something to consider. Uh, this is the sign. Ephesians chapter 4. Be kind one to another because Jesus has been to us. And then, 2 Timothy 2, the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but be kind to everyone. This is in this context, by the way, of how, you, how do you respond to people who don't believe what you do? 
I have been in so many different settings like that this last semester and ever since the time I've been teaching in public university where my responsibility is, you know, I keep thinking in my mind, you know, I would love to lay out my 12-page response here to you, but the best way to go about that is with gentleness and respect and kindness and patience with people who absolutely don't believe what I believe. And so our responsibility is to be kind to everyone. But as soon as I say that, I need to tell you what I think of this sign. I don't like this sign. It's like the coexist bumper sticker, which, by the way, I, I'll never forget this. I, I walk for exercise, and one, of, one day I was walking by this vehicle that had the coexist bumper sticker on one side of the back bumper, and on the other side was, my kid knows karate. Okay, just think about the irony of that. Some of you will get that after lunch, okay? But, you know, the, the impact of such a thing, you're telling the rest of us to coexist, but your kid's going to beat me up if I don't, you know. All right, thank you. I th figured I needed to give some more explanation <laughs> for that one. Just be kind is a command. My first question is always going to be, who are you to tell me to be kind? What's the classic response to this? Come on, man. You know, seriously, where do you get the authority to tell me to just be kind? Only Jesus gives us that authority. All right, when we talk about the church, we need to talk about Brant and Yancey because these guys did this great work back in the 80s writing these wonderful books, Fearfully and Wonderfully Made in His Image, which is all about the body. Okay, and by the body, we're talking about not only the physical body, Brant was this beautiful and marvelous practitioner of medicine. Yancey was uh, helping to write the book. But here are all of these classic passages about the body. And I think that's really an important question. And that's another homework assignment for you. Why is the image of the body appropriate to describe God's people at church? Go read those passages. It becomes very, very clear. Just a couple of other books on that note. Colson's book with Vaughn is important. But also, and one that I would suggest to everybody, is Dietrich Bonhoeffer's book, Life Together. If you want to study a book about how to be together as the body, as the church, Bonhoeffer sets the stage for us in that regard. So back to this issue of image from the last couple of weeks. What, is, what are we supposed to image? We are to image the one who has made us. We are not to image ourselves. The ultimate responsibility of the Christian is to mirror the one who made us which, of course, brings us back to this slide I've been showing over and over and over again. Our authority for all of this comes out of the Scriptures and recognizing our responsibility within ourselves. Once we are Christ followers, we bear responsibility for that and the discipline that comes from the gratitude we have for having, it, having had it given to us, which is what this has been all about. These 12 episodes is about how do we look at our culture and how are we thinking differently than everybody else which is what I've repeated every single week on these handouts right at the top, these five ideas. I'll just repeat them and highlight them here. Belief affects behavior. Behavior affects belief. Both goes both ways. Everybody everywhere has assumptions and pre-thinking. We talked about that right at the outset. Christian pre-thinking, that is where I start, my assumptions are molded by scriptural doctrine. Everybody has doctrine. Everybody's got these tenets of belief that form their thinking, and ultimately then it affects everybody's living. So don't let anybody tell you it's only Christians who have doctrine. They've got doctrine too. They just don't want to fess up to it. Now because I believe that repetition is the mother of all of education, I'm just going to fly through these 12 episodes to remind us where we've been and why it's important. Have we lost our minds? We need to begin to think as Christians. The second thing we talked about was making sense of everything. That is that God's world and has and how he has made it is sensible and practical. We cannot be evolutionists, episode three, naturalists, because otherwise we have absolutely no reason or basis for doing anything, which reminds me, of, of course, of uh, some of my students who want to incorporate ethical statements into their papers who are giving naturalistic, the, this world and all life is, is all that there is and there is no God, but then when I write these comments to them, 
about you have no basis for your ethics. Uh, you know, there's crickets in the background. They haven't ever thought about these things before. So this is something that we demand of them to consider the importance of why uh, their worldview doesn't hold water. Then we talk about taste or truth, that permanent truth is important. Remember I asked you, do we uh, eat French food or French people? Yeah. Image is everything, God's image. is crucial for helping us to understand that every person we see, no matter who they are, is the imaging God. Six, the gates of hell, the cosmic battle continues since Genesis 3. It's nothing new, and it continues. We all cons are concerned about justice, but some, sometimes it morphs into revenge, and so we have to be really careful about that and understand that justice ultimately is going to be given by God. We are indeed bad to the bone. There is a permeation of sin that rocks everything in our lives, and so we need to recognize that constantly, even about the motives and intentions of our thinking. There's only one who's going to overcome that for us, and that's Jesus, who then gives us an opportunity for a final destination with him. We then talked last week about throwing God's weight around, that is, giving him glory, which is what that's all about. And this week is that we don't do this alone, that we do this together collectively as a body of believers, the church. Of course, as always, I end with lots of questions, and these are things that I think are important for all of us. Do we live our lives as in individualism and hedonism? Does the church practice community with individuality? Do we recognize each other's gifts, and do we live in community with those gifts and appreciating everybody's points of view or their, what the gifts that God has given? How will your choices for happiness affect others? I think that's an important question we should always be asking. What is the thing I'm about to do or say going to impact somebody else? How will the decisions for happiness of others affect you? And sometimes they will affect you negatively. So the question isn't why did this happen, but how do you respond? And that's a hard thing to deal with as well. And then number five, identify at least two events, local or international, where the church has worked as community. And what are the characteristics of those efforts? We ought to be giving ourselves uh, to those kinds of things. So these kinds of questions, I think, for us are huge and things that we should be considerate of. I've also listed a whole bunch of other questions. I'm not even going to touch on them. I'll just say they're all on your handouts if you're so inclined. And honestly, a lot of them have to do with family, parenting, and uh, children. Um, how do we think differently as parents? How do we instruct our children? How do we get them to think these kinds of questions? Uh, for themselves, which of course is the end of this particular series. Uh, I hope we have not lost our minds, but we've learned how to use our minds and that we love God with them and that we learn how to function properly as biblical Christians in culture. Thank you for being here this fall semester. It's been a joy to teach. Blessings on the holiday.